since this is supposed to be more technical, less general audience, I, I was going to focus on one or two issues in more detail. And one of the things that are of interest is how do you develop these bulk glass forming alloys like the amorphous stainless steel that I talked about yesterday. Uh, I'll talk about our current state of understanding of crystal nucleation and growth in undercooled liquid alloys and how we zero in on these uh, very detailed compositions that show exceptional glass forming ability and make that a focal point or theme. So the preliminary stuff, what's a glass? It's a liquid that freezes with no crystallization. Crystals form by nucleation and growth. The barrier for nucleation becomes infinite when you go to the liquidest temperature of a crystalline phase or the melting point of a, a single crystal, right? As the driving force goes to zero, capillary, capillarity wins or however you like to look at it. The nucleation barrier diverges, so it, it drops precipitously like some power law and mobility drops precipitously on the other side, and the two competing factors lead to a very sharp peak in the rate of crystal nucleation and growth. And of course, that's a, the simple pictures for homogeneous nucleation, fluctuations in a uniform liquid, and real liquids are full of junk. Oxides, if you're a metal, you have oxides, you have other debris, and What's nominally called homogeneous might not be so homogeneous. You might have miscibility gaps. You might have other chemistry going on in an undercooled liquid that creates uh, fluctuate, large fluctuations in chemistry or in homogeneities. So things could get complicated. But that's basically nucleation. We have a rheological transition, atomic diffusion and mobility, drop as we lower temperature around the melting point of a metal. Typical viscosity is in millipascal seconds or tens of millipascal seconds. Um, at the glass transition, it's 10 to the 12. So we have 15 orders of magnitude between the high temperature liquid and the low temperature liquid. And that's what's going to kinetically freeze our liquid and freeze out nucleation. And of course, um, all this started with actually Becker and Doring back in, and then Tom Ahn in Göttingen back in the 1930s who were studying nucleation from a vapor to form liquid droplets and Turnbull extended this kind of thing to crystals nucleating in the liquid phase and he did these pioneering uh, experiments where you undercool liquid mercury and tin droplets in a microscope and he noticed you could undercool them by 20% below the melting point of the metal quite easily. They don't form glass but they undercool substantially. If you have enough sluggish enough kinetics that time scale gets stretched so if the melting point is low enough compared to the glass to the glass transition some characteristic rheological temperature then uh, you can freeze this nucleation out and this led Turnbull to conjecture that any liquid would form a glass if you cool it fast and of course cooling things fast was something my advisor at Caltech got involved with that's a, that's a whole story in itself. That, 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 project, that work actually evolved out of a project during World War II, looking at the combustion chamber of a V2 rocket engine and how they, how they cooled the chamber wall was titan, porous titanium. And the heat transfer over a liquid boundary layer which is how Dewey got interested in quenching liquids on copper surfaces. Nevertheless, uh, he quenched liquids and he was a metallurgist and familiar with humerottery rules and things. And so they started exploring humerottery phases and 
discovered that silver silicon formed metastable solutions. Uh, silver copper had limited solubility. If you rapidly cool, you can extend the solubility. If you do gold silicon, which is a eutectic with restricted solubility, you make a glass by splat quenching, which he published in a nice paper in Na Nature in 1960. And that's a little splat, I think that splat's palladium silicon. So if you cool metals fast, even simple binary alloys, binary eutectic alloys make glass. And we got involved in this over the years. I had a visitor from Germany in the late 80s who actually was, oh, Al Draymond, Wing Kui were students with Dave Turnbull at Harvard. They, did both did their senior thesis with me at Caltech in 1978. And they went off to Harvard. I, I told them you should go somewhere else for graduate work. <laughs> and uh, Al Draymond came back and gave us a seminar in 1981, or 82. And he had an ingot of palladium nickel phosphorus that was about the size of the, your thumbnail, a few grams of alloy. And, and it, they made it amorphous by cooling it in some boron oxide flux. And I thought that was remarkable. I was used to little thin foils of splat point stuff, the Douay stuff. And here you made an ingot that you could do some heat transfer. The cooling rate was probably only 10 to the two in the fluxed ingots. And so this led to the idea of, man, maybe these metallic glasses are not just allied signal ribbons or splats, maybe you can make bulk stuff. And we got very involved in that, and the, a few years later, Hans Fecht was at Caltech, and um, there was a couple of papers that appeared in the Japanese literature from Akihisa Inoue in Sendai, which led us to start looking at some titanium zirconium alloys. Uh, this is a zirconium titanium nickel copper beryllium alloy and my graduate student came in one day and said, uh, you know, I melt these things in the arc melter or on a levitation system, and the whole damn ingot's the glass. It doesn't crystallize. And you could do some calculations. I think, well, the critical cooling rate must be really slow. <laughs> so these are wonderful glass formers. And so they freeze as glassy ingots. You do high res TEM, you get a nice glass and x-ray looks like a liquid, you get a glass transition, they crystallize. The distance from this, to, from the glass transition to this exothermic crystallization peak is, varies a lot, but typically 60, 80, 100, 100 degrees. And then the crystal remelts, and so you get bulk glass. All right, so first thing we wanted to do when we got these bulk glasses, I mean, so nucleation rates were low enough that would, this would make experiments on the undercooled liquid on practical time scales feasible. We ought to be able to go in and measure the nucleation kinetics. We should be able to do TTT diagrams. Um, we ought to be able to study the rheology and try to scope this out in some detail, which would be interesting to do for a metal. Metals are very different than silicates and polymers. The, they're simple atomic liquids. They're supposed to crystallize fast. These, these should be kind of model systems for understanding nucleation and glass formation. Uh, I had a colleague at JPL at the time who had developed a very fancy version of the Millikan oil drop experiment where they use electrodes and XYZ electrodes, uh, ultraviolet light to induce a photo, photoelectric charge on a drop and electric fields of a few thousand volts per centimeter and you can overcome gravity and levitate a drop that's substantial in size you can mechanically ping it, get the freak Lamy frequencies, get surface tension, watch the damping, 
get the viscosity of the high temperature liquid, at least when the, drops, the drop oscillations are under damped, right? We could get this as a fun. You can use lasers to control the temperature. Um, we can modulate the laser power and watch the temperature response with a silicon pyrometer and back out the heat capacity and integrate that to get enthalpy, free energy. Uh, it's all sitting in a vacuum, an ultra-high vacuum, no container. It's the perfect way to study a, a high-temperature liquid, like a titanium-zirconium alloy that you can't process anyway. So my colleague had developed this electrostatic levitation business. That's a droplet of a vitreous zirconium titanium alloy in the molten state above the melting point, uh, levitated against gravity in a 10 to the minus 8 tor vacuum, melted by lasers, like a ruby laser, and a, we have a CO2 laser to melt it. We actually could put a lot of mirrors and fancy optics, so you get four laser beams, and you have uh, laser heating on a, on a tri-axis system, which is much more symmetric than with one beam, so you could get uh, very uniform temperature on a sphere. The temperature gradient's less than one degree. There's a whole bunch of issues here. I just thought I'd bring all that up, <laughs> kind of thing I didn't talk about yesterday. Uh, the, this guy was a fantastic guy with uh, a green thumb do experiments. So we, uh, he had developed this ESL. That's one of my grad students, Sandeep Mukherjee. And we could go in here and do all kinds of things to study undercooled liquids. That's the best place in the world to study an undercooled liquid. Uh, we, we measured a lot of different things. I mentioned nucleation and growth. You can take the drop at 1,000 degrees. Stefan Boltzmann radiative cooling gives you a cooling rate of 10K per second. So you can go from the melting point of the alloy up here above 1,000. You can cool down in a uh, few seconds to various temperatures. You can turn off the lasers. You can map out the steady state temperature versus laser power. And then you go to high temperature. You turn off the laser and hit a, hit a target temperature, put in the correct steady state power, and you can do a hold. We can measure a TTT diagram under the kind of ideal circumstances it was intended to be measured, where you suddenly cool a liquid and then sit at a constant temperature and measure the time delay to nucleation of crystals. And we could go in and map the TTT diagrams for nucleation and growth. That's one of these uh, bulk vitreloy alloys. And we, you see in, in vitreloy, Vitreloy 1, the kind of PECAR alloy, uh, it takes a minute to form a, in a 3 millimeter ball. It takes one minute statistically to catch the first crystal. You can calculate the number of nuclei per second per cubic centimeter that are forming and the homogeneous nucleation rates of 10 to minus 19 or 18. It's very low. Uh, there's a mean waiting time to reach the nose. And that's a, a nucleation rate per unit volume. So we can measure these nucleation rates. Actually, it's not a Poisson distribution, a waiting time distribution. There's more like an incubation time. And then the nucleation kicks on. So it's not actually random fluctuations. Uh, if you cool the liquid to some temperature, there's an incubation time to establish a topological and chemical distribution of nuclei. And once that incubation time or transient nucleation time is passed, then you, you'll ramp up nucleation to some steady state rate. That's more like the homogeneous steady state nucleation rate. So I, I point out transient nucleation turns out it's important here. Uh, most of that waiting time to the TTT diagram is to incubate the distribution. 
probably chemical ordering of some kind. Hmm? These are eutectic alloys. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they're eutectics. They're actually complicated eutectics. So instead of the simple binary diagram, we have ternary eutectics like palladium nickel phosphorus and quaternary eutectics like zirconium titanium nickel copper. And these are true quaternary eutectics. There's a quaternary invariant point where you have a liquid in equilibrium with four crystalline phases of different composition. Okay? And because of entropy of mixing and negative heat submixing in the liquid relative to the crystalline phases, with these eutectics can be very deep. And in vitriolite one, the Pekar alloy, the eutectic temperature is around actually 650. And in a system where the elements melt at between 1400 and 1900 degrees, these are extremely deep multi-component eutectics, and the higher order eutectics have relatively deeper eutectic or lower lying eutectic temperatures. Everybody know what a eutectic is? This is supposed to be a kind of student seminars. <laughs> Ask if you want, if you have a question. <laughs> anyway. Um, so we, we have these chemical fluctuations, they incubate, they reach some critical value at some degree of undercooling, and then we get nucleation. Uh, to crystallize the eutectic, of course, you need to simultaneously, if, if you can have one phase grow as a dendrite, that's primary crystallization, you can have multiple phases simultaneously grow at a, in a, to grow a, a eutectic morphology or eutectic structure. It's called coupled eutectic growth, coupled phases growing together. And um, I'll show you later in the talk that the coupled eutectic growth velocity in some of these alloys is incredibly high. If you take like Jackson and Hunt and Trivedi and all these nice theories of coupled eutectic growth, uh, the velocities we're looking at here are meters per second that go like hell. And you can show that, that the chemical segregation, if that were occurring entirely during the growth of the phases, capillarity aside and interphase energies, at the speeds we're talking about here and looking at diffusion, in the glass, uh, these kind of velocities mean that it almost has to be the case that the chemical ordering, the microsegregation that's required to grow the multiple phases has almost already occurred in the liquid before the nucleation event. So that the crystal, the coupled eutectic growths more like dominoes falling down. The rate at which the domino falls is kind of what we call the alpha relaxation time of the liquid. The, it's the Maxwell relaxation time. And the dominoes are what we call shear transformation zones. And you can calculate the, the maximum growth velocity at these temperatures would be meters per second. And that's what we see. So there's a long story here. It's not all resolved. Um, so, we have eutectics. Now, I'm going to focus on, an, on a couple of issues here in the talk. Uh, people ask me, how the hell do you guys find these five component eutectic compositions and figure out that the, exactly this point is where, where you make a centimeter, two centimeter diameter glass, bulk glass? Well. It's incredibly sensitive to composition, and it's, it's an interesting story. Um, the simple story is, and Dave Turnbull already pointed this out the 50 or 60 years ago, that 
The kinetics are related to Tg. That's sort of a characteristic temperature on a viscosity curve where it's 10 to the 12th. And that doesn't mean you've got the whole viscosity curve. The viscosity curve has a slope. That's called fragility. Right? So the kinetics are a, a Tg and a fragility parameter. We'll talk about that. And the thermodynamics versus the kinetics is sort of the eutectic temperature versus this rheological temperature. And that the ratio of those is called the Turnbull parameter. And Turnbull said 50 years ago, if that's two thirds, you get bulk glass. If the glass transitions two thirds of the melting point of anything, then you should have easy glass formation. That's called the Turnbull criteria. That's it, very simple. And he points out that silicate glasses and SiO2 and lime silicates and soda silicates and uh, so on have uh, TR, Tg over Tm is two thirds. That's the magic number. In vitrolloy one, it's close to two thirds too. Then we get bulk glass. So Turnbull's idea that anything will form a glass if you cool it fast is essentially correct. And if that ratio is two thirds, you don't have to cool it very fast at all. <laughs> so you get bulk glasses. So there's that parameter. And I said the viscosity, okay, people who t talk about kinetics and liquids talk about fluidity or the inverse of it, viscosity. And they talk about atomic diffusion, and we're in multi-component alloys, so diffusion is complicated. You have chemical diffusion along different chemical directions. Uh, uh, and diffusion is not exactly the same as viscosity or mobility or, or fluidity. Uh, Nominally, they're related in simple theories of one component systems that's something called the Stokes-Einstein relations, which says the diffusion and the viscosity are, are related by a universal constant times temperature. Uh, that breaks down in liquids. That's part of what makes glasses interesting and undercooled liquids interesting. The Stokes-Einstein relation itself breaks down and diffusion of chemical species doesn't necessarily always track viscosity. That's a whole story, it's interesting too. But, but as a first cut, viscosity measures the uh, rearrangement rate of atoms in a, in a liquid. In the old days, Turnbull thought of atoms during crystallization, for example, moving one atom at a time across an interface to grow a crystal. We know that atoms don't move individually, that these days we have p potential energy landscape theory and STZs and uh, we talk about alpha. The rearrangements in an undercooled liquid are cooperative motion of many atoms. In a, in a metallic glass there, Sharon Glotzer and I were talking yesterday, Sharon has identified a lot of the motion in terms of strings, little chains of atoms that move around. There are approximately clusters of 10 atoms that rearrange themselves. And if you're a mechanics guy, you call it an STZ. It rosters between two, two configurations of the atoms. And it's a cooperative motion of 10, 20 atoms. Right? That's the mechanism of atomic rearrangement. It's not one atom in a vacancy hopping from, like in a crystal. It's this cooperative motion. Right. I call them buckles, they're buckle modes. And all the configurations of the liquid are accessible by sequence and a hierarchy of buckling. It's like a structure buckles up and buckles down. That's kind of like what a liquid is. Um, one of the interesting things is what's the kinetics and the thermodynamics of these buckles. They have a lot of really interesting properties, but no time. I don't have time to do all that. Okay, we got this viscosity curve and mobility. Never mind, it's not, not exactly diffusion, but it's atomic mobility. It's buckling rate or rearrangement rate for atoms in an undercooled liquid. And you notice that uh, liquids vary enormously 
when you plot the viscosity as a function of uh, dimensionless temperature, inverse temperature, Tg, liquids are, have very different rates of fall of viscosity as you go above the glass transition. It's enormously different. Austin Angel pointed this out in the 90s. He identified the, the slope of you plot this logarithmically and you plot this versus that dimensionless parameter, you have a slope here at Tg. That tells you how steep the viscosity falls off. That's called the angel fragility parameter, M. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So what I want you to know, thermodynamics or the characteristic temperatures for um, kinetics are, are Tg. Thermodynamics is the liquidus temperature or the eutectic temperature. And the ratio is one parameter. And the other parameter of interest here is how fast mobility falls off. So if I go up here that this is Tg, and I go up to higher temperature, like the melting point, if I were two-thirds, then this would be 0.66. So in vitreloy 1, that's the melting point around here of the alloy. And you see the viscosity is already pretty high there. It's already one pascal second. It's like honey. So at the melting point, this stuff has, is pretty thick already. Um, and you notice the M for vitreloy 1 is pretty small. The M for other liquids is much higher. You see these are called fragile liquids and strong liquids. Uh, essentially, what this ends up meaning is that the viscosity of a very strong liquid is pretty much arenius over the whole temperature range. There's a single activation energy. In fragile liquids, the apparent activation energy changes enormously as you go down, which then shapes this mobility curve according to the, the M value. And the simple analysis, classical nuclear, if you just do classical nucleation theory and take Franz Spoppen's model of the entropy, entropic model of a metal liquid interface, you make a simple nucleation model. And then you could see how nucleation rates depend on things like uh, if we fix the Turnbull parameter for one of these eutectic liquids, we could vary the angel fragility. And this is how you would, in, in the classical term uh, nucleation picture, the homogeneous nucleation rate would peak at this nose, and you, the, these, the, this is logarithmic. And it's in minutes, uh, my scale here. So that's uh, minus, uh, that's one minute. And so this, this is how, if you have a fixed dimensionless temperature ratio, how the nucleation rate would vary with fragility. Or you could fix the fragility. I fixed the fragility to the fragility of vitreloy 1, our zirconium alloy, and looked at how varying the Turnbull parameter would vary the nucleation rate. This is, again, logarithmic. That's 10 natural on a natural log scale, so that's about 10 to the 4. So you vary, this would vary the crystallization rate by 10,000 times as you go across that parameter range. All right, so now I want to take this very simple idea that we have this Turnbull parameter. I claim if you have the Turnbull parameter and you know the temperature dependence of the mobility, that you ought to be able to make a a nice scaling argument about the nucleation rate. Just a simple idea. It's taking what Turnbull did originally with the Turnbull parameter and adding the idea of fragility. It's just taking Turnbull's, right? So you have, want to have high glass forming ability, you should have a high Turnbull parameter. You should have a low M to get a high viscosity at the same dimensionless temperature. 
and this should give you uh, high glass warming ability. The nose time should then be long. That means, for example, when you're casting things, the Fourier, trans so the Fourier heat flow equation, transient solution for quenching a rod, uh, would give a cooling rate on the center line that scales with the square of the size of the rod. So that's the kind of scaling law for casting thickness versus nose time. And uh, so if we use casting thickness as an indicator of nose time, and we, okay, Turnbull made plots like that. That's the Turnbull parameter. These, this is a database of well-characterized metallic glasses that we've worked on over 20 or 25 years, where we have good viscosity data, we have good M, we have good thermodynamics, we have accurate slow scan calorimetry, we know the liquidus temperature, we know the glass forming ability, we've quantified it, and we made a database. It's published in Nature Communications in January this year. The database is a 30-page database that's appended to a paper called Origins of Metallic Glass Formation, Nature Communications, January this year. Uh, so you can get the data that's used for this. Um, that's the log base 10 of the casting thickness or the nose time. In many cases here, we did both the ESL, we did the TTT diagram, the casting thickness, we showed that they scale like D squared and all that. So it's a nice database. Um, and so if you just looked at Dave Turnbull's postulate that glass forming ability goes with TRG, there's two thirds, um, that's the data for metallic glasses. It's in the Nature Com paper in January. Uh, correlation's not great. This is logarithmic. So two orders of magnitude here is a factor of 10 in the casting dimension. And this is plus or minus more than an order of magnitude, a factor of 20. So if I were just using Turnbull's parameter to predict metallic glass formation, I, I would have a scatter of plus or minus an order of magnitude and a half. That's not a very good description. But now I go back and I can also plot glass forming ability versus Angel's fragility. And as I say, these are all systems where we have good data for the temperature dependence of the viscosity at TG so we can define the M accurately. Good data. Without good data, you don't learn anything good experiments, good data, then you learn something. That's not so great either. The R squared is plus or minus a factor of 20 or 30, right? So I said, okay, let's just, you know, let's, let's be statistical analysis. We got something, core of the log of D squared is correlated with TRG and M. So, and we got a linear regression here. Let's just do a bilinear regression and try to correlate it with two parameters. And that's based on an idea that the mean waiting time for crystal nucleation per unit volume should have two factors. One is a kinetic factor that's related to viscosity. This W of T is comes from the fragility parameter. That's the temperature dependence here, and this is undercooling. You can use Boppin's interphase model or whatever. There should be two factors here. And let's do a Taylor series and keep two terms. So let's just say this is, since there's exponentials here, the leading term should look like that. So now that, that's a bilinear regression in Turnbull's parameter and Angel's parameter, okay? Let's take my metallic glass database and fit it. And I just went from an R squared of 0.6, if you like, you know, correlation, correlations in fits, to 0.984. Well, I went back, we did a statistical analysis of our experimental errors 
in determining M and TRG, there's an error in all those things. Uh, it depends on how accurately you measure viscosity. You can put an error in that. You can calculate the errors and propagate them through the formula, and that's just about experimental error. The remaining variance in the data from the, the bilinear regression is within experimental error. That's as good a theory of nucleation as you can do, that you're allowed to do based on your knowledge of the parameters, which is what we claim in the Nature Com paper. So that within, within the limits defined by experimental error, we can predict metallic glass formation precisely if we know TRG and M. That's it. It's that simple. Pretty shocking. Uh, the classical nucleation theory involves the interfacial free energy between the liquid and the crystal, and that's a function of which crystal's nucleating. If you're at a eutectic, you have multiple crystals that have interfaces with liquids. They have different compositions defined by the common tangents of the liquid free energy curve to each crystal. It's a complicated mess. You can take all that and throw it under the rug. All you need to know is TRG and M. And it doesn't matter whether the alloy is hyper-eutectic or hypo-eutectic or which branch of the nucleation curve we're looking at, which liquidus curve I'm looking at. The, it's, a, it's a pretty simple picture. It means that there must be something simple about nucleation theory. And I already pointed out to you that there's an incubation time there. Somehow this incubation time is just depending. <laughs> These two parameters capture that. OK. I'm not a theoretician. I won't explain why it works. But there it is. Right. So if you just go one step beyond what Turnbull was claiming, and you add, you combine Angel's fragility parameter with Turnbull's parameter, you get a wonderfully accurate description. That's the basis for developing bulk glass, is understanding that you need to, to look at the rheology and you need to look at the eutectic temperature and the variation of Tg with composition. And of course, at a eutectic, we have meeting liquidus curves that meet at an invariant point, the eutectic temperature, right? So there ought to be a cusp in glass forming ability around the eutectic. And the fact that all this free energy that's specific to which crystal isn't very important means that, that the peak in glass forming ability should be very close to the eutectic. You should get cusp-like maxima versus composition. So, so we, we took this idea. We go back and we, we said, let's look at, at the glass-forming alloys that are out there. Palladium silicon was one of the oldest known glasses. And, Ho Su Chen at Bell Labs back in the 1970s discovered he could water quench that in a quartz tube and make a one millimeter rod. That was probably the first bulk glass. And it's palladium with 6% copper and 17% silicon or something, right? So we said, let's just take palladium copper silicon and let's start fine tuning it. Let's find out exactly where the eutectic is. Let's find out what the rheology, the viscosity of an amorphous sample looks like, and how it varies with silicon and copper content. We went back and we just played around with that. Uh, we discovered instead of a one millimeter glass, we can make palladium copper silicon of one and a half centimeters. We, we made it 15 times thicker. That's 200 times longer nose time. <laughs> when we took nickel phosphorus, Nickel phosphorus boron, these are glasses that are out there. They were known. Um, nickel phosphorus boron with chromium, that's a quaternary alloy. 
we could make a glass with a four or five millimeter rod out of something that was previously only known to form ribbons and foils, right? Uh, which means that if you really want to do metallic glass as well, you've got to go back and take everything that was out there in the literature and throw it away and redo it. Do it carefully because the errors are... So I just want to... Uh, here's palladium nickel phosphorus. I got miss, miss the I in nickel. This is, pal this is the old Turnbull glass with the ingot from Drayman. Um, why does the ternary alloy have such high glass forming ability? Well, it turns out that it's the rheology that combines with the fact that the ternary has a eutectic that's deeper. Uh, the pseudo-binary has a eutectic that's deepest at about 50-50, actually about 40% nickel, 0.4 nickel, 0.6 palladium. This is logarithm of the casting thickness squared, right? So that's one order of magnitude. That's two orders of magnitude. That's going from a 100 micron foil to a one centimeter rod. <laughs> that's going from melt spinning in metals, metallic glass parlance to bulk glass rods. And that's all because uh, of the lowering of the eutectic temperature in the ternary, but also almost half of the story is the rheology is changing, the angel parameter. And if we, we take these data from Ho Su Chan and we put all the data in the literature from 50 years of palladium nickel phosphorus together, and you, you can understand why the ternary alloy makes a three centimeter rod, whereas these are our foils. These are melt spun ribbons. So, <clears throat> well, so let me just give you a little taste of what it takes then to go in and figure out exactly where the eutectic is in a system and how does glass forming ability change as you vary compositions? And I'm going to talk about a five component alloy, one that I brought up yesterday. It's nickel chromium, it's a little bit of niobium, and phosphorus and boron. Those are the five components. And there's a five component eutectic in there at a very precise composition, which we don't know going in. And we want to find that. So you're in a five component alloy. If you do thermodynamics, that means there's four compositional degrees of freedom. That means there's four independent Gibbs phase rule, all that, right? For the students, this is where Gibbs phase rule gets in. We need five directions in composition space to scope out a map of anything versus composition. So what we do is we take different directions in composition space. This is one direction. Here u is the variable. And I told you you have to do this stuff carefully. Here I'm varying the chromium content. I'm only going to show you one or two. I have 10 of these plots where U goes along a different direction in composition space. We're going to make a map in, in 4D of glass forming ability, right? And that's one map. Okay, what are these little dots? Well, I have a postdoc who, he was a postdoc at Caltech. He works in my company. He's a wonderful guy to do alloy development. He makes quartz capillaries that are varying in thickness, and so when he does water quenching experiments, and he can define the critical casting diameter to make glass and, and reproducibly characterize this for the alloy, which we do. And here we're sort of, we coarse grain it to plus or minus a millimeter. An open circle means we made a glass at that diameter. A dot means it crystallized. And we're 
varying chromium in 1% or half percent steps. All right. Actually, when we do the boron variation or the phosphorus variation, we go in quarter percent steps. So we, we make a map. And that's the critical casting thickness. And oh my goodness, look how sharp this is. That's the eutectic. I can show you the slow scan melting curves. There's a liquidus that's pulling off of the primary melting exo, uh, endotherm. There's a liquidus surface going up if you go above here. And there's a primary nickel liquidus surface going up here. And that's the eutectic. Right? That, that's chromium. Um, just to show you that that's not even what I call sharp. That's niobium and chromium, a two-dimensional map that's based on making a grid. And I fit it to a topological contour map. Right? And that's glass forming ability in the chromium niobium plane around some fixed composition of the other variables. <laughs> Here's the, I think that one is niobium and boron. I cut it off here. This is boron. That is 2% boron, 3% and 4%. All this detail is within one and a half or 2% of boron. And that's a eutectic. That's a paratectic. <laughs> And some very fine details. The glass forming abilities mirrored, mirrors the phase diagram. Now, you, to do this stuff, you have to have a very reproducible way of measuring the critical casting thickness or the nose time. And we can't now levitate these in the levitator. They have phosphorus, which has a high vapor pressure and screws up the levitation. So we have to do these in capillaries. But, so we did this. And we optimize that. And there's the six component version that's fine tuned. This is the exponential cusp in glass forming ability. And we actually got up to about two centimeters. We make rods of nickel chromium, niobium 2.8, 3.2, 2. <laughs> phosphorus 16.5, boron 3.1. That's the eutectic, right? Uh, now, before I showed you that we had this bilinear fit. We fit the glass warming ability to reduce glass transition temperature and fragility, M. Right? So we can go back and we can unwind this. <laughs> um, there's the glass warming ability, for example, versus boron. And according to my Expression, and we should get exponential fits, we do. The peaks are exponential cusp. In the log of the nucleation time. So they're really sharp glass forming abilities, extremely detailed. Right? That's the angel fragility parameter. Well, look at this. If I go from 1.5% one one boron my angel parameter is 77. When I go to 3% boron, it's 59. And then it drops to 53 or 54. Here's where the peak in glass warming ability is, right there. Right? The angel fragility has a huge effect, and the boron is the whole story. If you hadn't put the boron in, you would only get a one millimeter glass. You understand what I'm saying here? You have to look at all the details. The story is incredibly detailed. Everything that was done on metallic glasses before 2010 is a bunch of very rough stuff. And there are alloys in the literature, and somebody says, OK, this is a one millimeter glass. That one millimeter glass might be a two centimeter glass if it had been optimized. We go back and rework. You can even rework vitreloy 1. If you rework vitreloy 1, uh, there's probably a glass in there that's got a critical casting thickness of one meter. 
that's almost impossible to crystallize. Okay. So, but there's garbage. Zirconium and titanium oxidize, so you get oxide particles, the heterogeneous nuclei, it all gets compromised if you've got junk. But, all right, so, uh, I'll just, I talked about some of this yesterday. I'm gonna just jump through quickly, because we're, we start 10 minutes late. You have this canonical <laughs> two pi over six shift. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's, let, I, I wanna show you uh, the nickel alloy that's the optimized alloy. And here, what we're doing is we're taking the material and uh, measuring fracture toughness. Now remember, I just showed you that the fragility of the liquid went from an M of 77 to an M of 50 something by changing boron one and a half percent. That's, that's incredible. It means that the, the temperature dependence of the viscosity curve changes, the slope changes by 20% just by putting a little bit of boron or not. Right? This is how, how Viscosity is kind of a measure of the barrier height for configurational rearrangement. That's related to things like the shear modulus and other stuff. And it's also related to mechanical properties. It's fascinating if we go back and look at how boron affects, for example, something like toughness. Okay? Notice these alloys, I've got one on here that's got a toughness of 100. That's tough, like steel. And it's pretty strong, two and a half GPA. That's like miraging steel. Strong as hell, tough as hell. It's strong like, my, tough like mild steel, strong like miraging steel. It's called damage tolerant. That's why we're interested in this kind of material. And of course, you get the high strength. You don't get ductility and tension. If you bend it, you get for these tough glasses where the, you can bend millimeter thick plates and stuff and they, they shear bend. That's important because if I, I don't want to use a metallic glass in tensile welding, it's going to slide off on a shear bend. It's, in, it's an, an instability where a single shear pan cuts across the sample, it slides off. But in bending, I suppose I want to make a frame for an iPhone. And I don't want the iPhone to crack when I drop it with a frame. I want it to bend. I want it to fail gracefully, not break. Right, so lots of applications like that involve, you don't have to have a lot of tensile ductility, but you need a, lot of, a decent amount of toughness. The amount of toughness you need depends on the dimensions of the things, you, the characteristic size of stress concentrators, stuff. Okay, that's why, so you can do toughness. If you do a strict Pre sharp pre crack, you get a K1C here, you, a notch toughness like that, for example. I'm going to skip that. Here's what I want to come to. This is the composition map in the chromium niobium cross section. I just show you that again, right? Here, what we've done, these little things are alloys that we made and tested mechanically. We measured strength and notch toughness. Some of them we measured K1C, a lot of work. That's a contour map here where we fit K1C. It goes from down here 
it goes from 95, the fracture toughness is almost 100. It's like steel, again. It goes from that to something that's a fracture toughness of uh, less than 30. Pretty brittle. That's the KQ. The K1C down here is actually three. That's ceramic brittle. This goes from a tough metal to a ceramic as we change the composition a few percent. Holy crap. It's correlated with the fragility of the liquid. Somehow the structure of this is locally changing when I add a few percent boron or chromium, right? I'm changing the structure in such a way that I dramatically affect the, hop, the barrier distribution for hopping and diffusion in the liquid. And I, I, when I freeze that in in the glass, I'm getting enormous variation in toughness, right? On that Ashby map with toughness and strength that I showed you a minute ago, 95 is tough, like a good metal, and a K1C of three is a ceramic. A tough ceramic's 10. Yttria stabilized zirconia, Art Hoyer, who gave one of these. Right? Metallic glass is all over the map. Back in the early 2000s, we had a program at DARPA with a program manager named Leo Christodoulou. And he wanted to make bulk glasses, bulk steel. And the guys at University of Virginia, my old colleague Joe Poon, who we were students together with the way. <laughs> I know Joe developed a wonderful iron glass. He called it amorphous steel. And it was you know, more than a centimeter thick. And they were, except the only problem is when you dropped it on the floor, it broke, right? I call it, we call it, I called it crack alloy. It was, the K1C is one, <laughs> right? Uh, so it had wonderful glass forming ability, but it had a very high M. And as you can see here, when you have a very high, a very low M, a low fragility, or you tend to get very brittle glass. So there's a ductile, there's a brittle to tough transition when you cross, now, there's another funny thing. If we look at the peak in the glass forming ability, these were the two ridges I showed you earlier, that falls right along here, where the toughness is going from 95 to 30, where the, frac the notch toughness is dropping from 95 to 30. Whatever's going on with this boron and the short range order and the chemistry has a dramatic impact on fragility, which reflects itself in a dramatic impact on glass warming ability or nucleation of crystals, and has a dramatic impact on mechanical properties, on toughness. Actually, it has a dramatic impact in how the how shear bands turn into cracks. <laughs> Somebody my, uh, was talking to uh, Michael Tallis this morning. He, he likes uh, interfaces and adhesion and cracks and so on. I think he had to leave early. But uh, basically, a shear band's like a mode two crack. At some point, if there's an opening stress, it's going to open, right? And how that happens, how much shear sliding you get before it opens, determines how long a shear bend can get before you get cavitation and it turns to a crack. That determines how big the plastic zone is ahead of the crack tip. And it goes from tens of nanometers in a ceramic or nanometers in a ceramic to millimeters in a very tough metallic glass like 
one of these glasses with a K1C of uh, 100. Okay? So it's how shear bands operate. There's a whole bunch of interesting science here, and it's linked up to some interesting technology, right? And I think, uh, well, let's see, should I? Uh, this, yeah, you can make metallic glasses really tough. There's one with a toughness of 200. That's actually as tough as the toughest metals, steels, mild steel. Hmm? So metallic glasses all the way along here <laughs> in the Ashby map. And what the hell decides whether we're a ceramic or whether we're tough as hell? I, you know, that, and how is this linked to things like boron chemistry? And how does that connect with how crystals grow and why you couple, finally, <laughs> I should show you um, properties. It's a pretty good engineering material. It's pretty tough. That's, that's this alloy that we were looking at. It's very strong compared to stainless steel. It's much more corrosion resistant. Uh, we're interested in using this where you use stainless steel in the real world, making hardware, dental hardware, sporting goods, connectors, fasteners, frames, casings, metal hardware, precision net shape, hardware that's strong, hard, wear resistant, corrosion resistant, and cheap to make. That part is, we, we developed, uh, in order to process metallic glasses at viscosities that are typical of plastic, and try to make the technology of making parts really look like plastic processing, right? What we've developed is a way of rapidly heating the metallic glass of, of charge or a feedstock charge to uniformly heat it to a temperature and do this forming fast enough to avoid the, the TTT curve, which we've been talking about. We have all the ingredients to understand what we need to do to make that work, right? So we've put that together and so you can go through TG, you can do your processing and forming and you have that much time until you hit the nucleation curve and crystallize and so on so you could process in. So we know what we need to do. We have viscosity data, the rheology, the M stuff. We know that. This is, uh, this is vitriloid 105, I think, and that's uh, heating time, he different heating rates, Crystallization, if I were to heat up here, 0.8 times the melting point, that's near the nose in the crystallization curve, then I would have a viscosity of 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 3, which is what I have in plastics when I do injection molding. Bottom. Okay. So that anyway, you could put it all together. And... I'll skip it. Viscosity is in the right range. We can build a machine to injection mold the metallic glass and make hardware out of nickel, iron, chromium, phosphorus, boron, glass. And I'll just stop there. Uh, I've, I've kind of spent a lot of time on the nucleation and the crystallization and where the glass forming ability story comes from. If you want to know more about the processing and so on, that's, a, that's another lecture or two. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. It's like a tank of gasoline or a bullet in a gun, uh, a battery has a lot of energy in it. And if that energy is released in a way that we don't want it to be released, uh, a fire can occur or even an explosion. Nowadays, lithium ion batteries are used